Joseph Fritzl was the most horrific story I've ever reported in 30 years of journalism, and it was the most touching story, especially when the little children coming out of the day under daylight for the first time in their life. Joseph Fritzl was one of those offenders who could maintain a public face of respectability, but that public face of respectability merely hid a far darker private reality. Surely the most extraordinary and the most tragic thing about Joseph Fritzl is that he managed to camouflage himself as a respectable member of society, as a pillar of community, while at the same time he was just leading this double life of monstrosity. On the 27th of April 2008, the horrific case of Joseph Fritzl sent shockwaves around the world. News report after news report gave details of a quite unbelievable story. For 24 years, Josef Fritzl had kept his own daughter captive in a cellar beneath his house. In that time, he'd used her as a sex slave and fathered seven children. I have come to Austria to try and discover why Josef Fritzl carried out his terrible crimes and how he kept his secret for so long. I'm standing here in the heart of Vienna, the capital city of Austria. Here in 2008, the world learned the gruesome details of Josef Fritzl and what he did to his young daughter. As a journalist, I find this story extraordinary. As a father, I find it abhorrent. How and why did this happen? By the age of 42, Elizabeth Fritzl had spent over half of her life living in captivity without sunlight and in cramped conditions, controlled by her father. When the police in Amstetten held a conference and broke the news of Josef Fritzl, the world's press responded. The first journalist to break the story worldwide was British-born Mark Perry, who works for a Vienna-based newspaper called Kronen Zeitung. Tell me about the impact in Austria when, when the story of Josef Fritzl broke. Uh, it actually was a tremendous impact. People were shocked, flabbergasted. Nobody could believe it. Nobody in the, world, in the whole world could believe it. But people, especially in Amstetten, the neighbours, the police officers, all of them. From the point of view of the criminal police, the missing person case, Elizabeth Fritzl, can now be deemed resolved. Nevertheless, police investigations will be continued. Where were you at the time? I was in the Waldviertel with my kids. Got a phone call uh, by my editor-in-chief. He just told me, we've got a big case um, unfolding here. I said, ah, big case. It's about Fritzl. I said, yeah, because Elizabeth she left her children on the doorstep and he said, no, it's worse, it's worse, it's worse, it's worse. Off I went to Amstetten and that's where I spent about two weeks. Josef Fritzl had made world headlines. He was born here in the somewhat unglamorous town of Amstetten in Austria on the 9th of April 1935. And it was this town and the house in which he lived that were to make world headlines in 2008. Well, I'm joined here in Austria by Professor David Wilson, Britain's leading criminologist, who's helping me to uncover the real facts behind the headlines. David Wilson, who was Josef Fritzl? You'd imagine in this very ordinary town that Josef Fritzl was going to have a very ordinary childhood and life. In fact, his childhood was extraordinary. Josef Fritzl's childhood is dominated by his mother and his grandmother. Josef's grandmother, Anna, is born also in Amstetten, but marries a mill owner. The grandmother and the mill owner were in a very loveless relationship because his grandmother, Josef Fritzl's grandmother, couldn't have children. So the mill owner resolved that particular problem by having a child with three different servants working in his household. One of those children that he had by a servant, therefore out of wedlock, was Maria, Josef Fritzl's mother. The family all lived at 40 Ebstrasse. In 1934, Fritzl's mother, Maria, 
met a very poor man called Joseph and became pregnant. The baby boy was also named Joseph. He was given his grandmother Anna's maiden name, Fritzel, ignoring his grandfather and father's involvement. On the 12th of March 1938, when Josef Fritzl was nearly three years old, Hitler's troops marched across the border into Amstetten. Hitler himself followed a few days later to be greeted by a large crowd. Young Josef Fritzl was in that crowd, perched on the shoulders of his father to greet the Fuhrer. Boyan Panchevsky is a European correspondent who has studied Josef Fritzl's early life. I'm going to meet him. Would it have been difficult at that time in Austria for a child born out of wedlock? Most certainly, yes. I think until very recently it would have been a difficult experience. The child would have been stigmatized by that experience in the local community. In 1938, 99.7% of Austrians voted to become part of the Third Reich. But young Josef Fritzl's mother didn't always conform to the ways of her new leaders. She had a feisty temper and angered the Nazi authorities. During the Second World War, she was arrested and interned to a concentration camp where she spent a few months and um, Josef was left on his own, so that must have left scars on, on the young boy's psyche. Nine-year-old Josef was sent to an orphanage during this period and told that his mother was dead. Only as the war ended did he realize she was still alive. Young Josef's father had joined the German army and fought on the Eastern Front until he was taken prisoner by the Russians. He was released in 1948 and returned to Amstetten, where he was shunned by both the boy and his mother. After the war, Fritzl's mother became even more eccentric and aggressive. Her discipline towards her son grew more violent. Fritzl's mother was not a loving mother. She wanted a child, but she didn't have the wherewithal, she didn't have the psychological makeup to understand that she had responsibilities for her child, that she should care for her child, and so she would regularly beat him. The relationship changed when Fritzl turned 15. He finally stood up against his mother's attacks. His own behavior also changed. We see some really difficult psychosexual behaviors uh, emerging around the time that Fritzl's going to stand up to his mother. So, for example, he becomes what's known as a lurker. We would probably call this a peeping Tom. He's going to listen out for uh, young couples having sex in their homes so that he can hear the, the, their sexual activity. He's also going to develop from that kind of behavior to exposing himself to women. In 1951, at the age of 16, Fritzl left his home in Amstetten and came here to the Austrian city of Linz, some 40 miles away from Amstetten, where he became an engineer for Voiced. In 1956, he met his wife, Rosemary Bayer. Well, they met um, when he was very young. He was working um, as a technical assistant in, a, in, a, in an engineering firm in Linz called First. And her father was a colleague of his. So I believe she was 16 or 17 years old. And um, he was immediately impressed with her. And then he told friends that she would make a good wife, a good housewife, because she, she seemed to be obedient, you know, accepting of things. By September 1963, after just seven years of marriage, Fritzl and Rosemary had three children, two daughters and a son. Josef Fritzl's job was going well. Engineers were in constant demand in the post-war years. The shabby, illegitimate boy had turned into a confident and authoritative man. He's sent by his employer to Ghana, and he doesn't return from those experiences until 1965. Meanwhile, his three children are getting older, and so one of the ways he deals with that situation is he's going to be violent and domineering. And quite quickly, Rosemary will fall pregnant again and give birth to their fourth child. On the 8th of April 1966, Elizabeth was born into an increasingly volatile household. Fritzl was an engineer in Linz and reverted to the predatory habits he'd picked up as a teenager. Here we are, 
we are in Linz, a not unattractive industrial city in the northern part of Austria, what they call Lower Austria, on the banks of the river Danube, and about an hour's drive from Amstetten. And it was to hear Professor David Wilson that Josef Fritzl would come when he wanted to escape Amstetten. Very pragmatic reasons. This was the closest large city. He could escape the scrutiny of a small town. And whilst he was here, of course, he could indulge in his sexual interests because he would visit the red light area. He got into trouble with the law here as well. Yes, in 1967, he was convicted of a rape. He followed a, a young mother home to her house. And then after she had fallen asleep, he broke into her house and at knife point raped her in her bed as her child was sleeping beside in a court. What sentence did he get? Fritzl only received 18 months for the rape of this young mother. But under Austrian law, the sentence doesn't stay on the record forever. No, and that's a very crucial point. After 15 years, any offender's record is wiped clean. And therefore, as far as the state is concerned, after 15 years, that rape never took place. And as far as Fritzl's wife was concerned, it was forgiven. Yes, she stood by him. She visited him in the prison, and she never mentioned the fact that her husband had been convicted of rape. By the end of 1972, the Fritzl family had grown. There were now seven children, four girls and three boys. Fritzl's reputation as an engineer was also growing. He was a respected member of the community. Or so they thought. I've travelled to Austria to retrace the extraordinary case of Josef Fritzl and his 24-year reign of terror over his captive daughter, Elizabeth. In 1973, Fritzl was a wealthy member of the Amstetten community. His reputation was growing. He decided to go into property and purchase the Zeistern guest house next to Monse Lake in Seitzgammergut, a three-story hotel with 40 bedrooms. He owned guest houses, he owned restaurants, he then bought this place in Monse, which included a restaurant and a camping place, and he ran it with a profit for a while, and then when, when he got financially into trouble, a place caught fire and, and burned down, and authorities suspected a, a insurance um, scam, but never managed to prove anything. In 1978, Josef Fritzl decided to expand the family home at 40 Ebstrasse in Amstetten. He wanted a roof terrace and a new extension in which to place nine new flats for tenants. He also applied for permission to build a rather large cellar. The plans were approved and construction began on a major scale. Fritzl's family life is one in which we are having to deal with what the serial killer Ian Brady once described as a house divided. How there's this very public face and this private reality. So the public face is of a successful businessman, an engineer who's living a respectable life, bringing up his children, being responsible, sending them to school. But the private reality is that Nobody wants to talk about these very problematic psychosexual behaviours which are clearly beginning to become more manifest in relation to his behaviour towards his children, especially his female children, and especially one particular female child, Elizabeth Fritzl. Elizabeth Fritzl was now 12 years old. Her manner reminded Fritzl of himself as a boy. He believed they had a special connection. Fritzl had become obsessed with his daughter. He spied on her and demanded to know where she was at all times. Elizabeth did have a few close friends, among them twins, Uta and Krista. Tell me about her. What was she like? Elizabeth actually was a very lovely girl. We became friends from the moment we started going to school. I always say that the right people always come together, and that was the case with Elizabeth and I. We knew that several things in the family were not okay. Well, one sensed it, but you didn't talk about it. She was a calm person, I was also very calm, and that was why we got together. We walked together to school, and that way we became closer. 
Tell me about Joseph Fritzl. What, what sort of man was he? Can you describe him to me? When I was a child and saw him, I thought, OK, not a good man. Well, his appearance, you sensed it. But we never spoke to him when we were children. We only saw him. How could you tell he was not a good man? The strictness in the face, the sinister eyes, no smile, no kindness. In September 1981, Elizabeth started a tourism and gastronomy course in Waldeck, a small town 12 miles from Amstetten. She also worked in a petrol station restaurant to support herself. But at home, behind closed doors, Fritzl's obsession grew. In effect, what was happening to uh, Elizabeth Fritzl in private was that her father was exposing himself to her, leaving pornographic magazines under her pillow, and was uh, beginning to sexually abuse her. Did Elizabeth ever speak to you about her father and what her father was doing? No, she didn't really speak about it. Also, it was forbidden. I realized that it was forbidden for her. What happens at home stays at home and is not brought outside. That's why she was a very calm, quiet person. The construction work at the family home was developing. Fritzl had built a labyrinth of rooms beneath the new extension. The flats above were rented out to tenants but had a high turnover, so nobody asked any questions. On the 28th of January, 1983, Elizabeth ran away from home. She left her home when she was still underage, but then she, um, there was a, a warrant sent out, obviously, because she was a minor, so she, she got uh, found by police in Vienna, and they called her, her father, and they drove all the way back from, from Vienna to Amstetten, and, uh, and in the car already, he promised her that he will never let her run away again, which must have sounded like a terrible sentence to her at the time. By the summer of 1983, the cellar was completed. It had lighting with many interconnecting rooms. It was to be used for storage and as a workshop. He has been desperate to control that space since he was a boy. So he upgrades it, he uses his building skills, he uses his engineering skills, he uses his contacts in the building trade to be able to redecorate, to redesign, cutting up the space in a way that would allow him the maximum control of that space. In May 1984, Elizabeth Fritzl announced she was going to move in with her sister in nearby Litz. Now, you see, here we've got a problem for Fritzl. He likes what he's doing to Elizabeth. He does not want to lose Elizabeth, whom he's been sexually abusing. He wants to control her. He wants to dominate. Elizabeth has revealed to him her escape route. I'm going to leave here. I'm leaving this space. There could be a sense in which Fritzl himself might have been worried that once she was out of that private space, she might publicly talk about what had happened to her. So this is a crisis point for him. He has to stop Elizabeth Fritzl from leaving Forty Ebstrasse. On the 28th of August, 1984, Josef Fritzl lured Ada into the cellar of the house, drugging and handcuffing her before incarcerating his own daughter. He has some ruse about carrying a door down to the garage. And then once the door is in the garage, he says to Elizabeth, oh, come into my study, I want to talk about something privately with you. She goes into his study, and whilst her back is turned to him, we now know that he used a chloroformed uh, infused rag to cover her face to knock her out. He's then going to carry Elizabeth's body into this hidden space that, uh, as far as the authorities are concerned, doesn't exist. And that hidden space contains simply a bed, uh, a TV, a video, and he chains Elizabeth within that space. Fritzl forced his daughter to write a letter saying she'd run away and joined a cult. He then drove 100 miles out of town to post the letter. When did you first report on anything to do with the Fritzl family? 
that was, I think, in 1984, was it 86? Five. And that's when I got a call from the local police station in Amstetten and they asked me, please put a picture of, of Elizabeth in the paper. We're looking for her desperately. It looks like a crime, but we don't know what happened to her. And that was the first ever item on Elizabeth Fritzl that was ever published worldwide. Josef Fritzl had said, my daughter has run away. She's she run away. We had an anonymous phone call, although we had a secret number, but... She said, ah, oh, yeah, I was phoned, and she's in a cult, and Dad, I'm not coming back home. And in reality, she was downstairs and being raped and on a dog's leash, and, yeah, that, that, that's when I first reported. Fritzl kept his daughter in the secret cellar. He'd beat her, torture her, and rape her repeatedly. Elizabeth Fritzl inevitably is going to become pregnant because her father is raping her on a recurring basis. The first child that um, she has miscues. So the first child that's actually born is in 1988, and it's a girl, a girl called Kirsten. Can we just try and imagine how awful this birth must have been? In fetid, humid, dark and dank conditions, Fritzl has given his daughter a book on childbirth, a towel, a pair of scissors, and a couple of nappies, and in effect has just allowed Elizabeth to deliver her child by herself. In 1990, a second child, Stefan, was born. By 1991, Elizabeth Fritzl had been incarcerated in the cellar beneath number 40 Eastrasse for almost seven years. In that time, she'd given birth to two children, Kirsten and Stefan. Now she was pregnant with a third. Meanwhile, upstairs, her mother, brothers and sisters lived on, completely unaware of her plight. I'm exploring the kidnapping and enslavement of 18-year-old Elizabeth Fritzl in Amstetten in Austria in 1984. And the man behind the atrocity, her father, Josef Fritzl. There were now two families living at 40 Eibstrasse in Amstetten, one above stairs and one below, and all controlled by Josef Fritzl. In August 1992, Elizabeth and Fritzl's third child, Lisa, was born. She had a heart defect. Pragmatically, I think Fritzl is worried that the so-called sound-proofed cellar is not going to be able to cope with a small baby who is constantly in pain and therefore constantly crying. And one can also presume that Elizabeth herself is saying to her father that there's something wrong with the baby and he has to take action. And the action that he takes is that he puts Lisa on their doorstep of 40 Ibstrasse with a note which again Elizabeth has been forced to write saying this is her daughter would her parents please look after the little girl. The little girl is found on the doorstep and brought into the household. Baby Lisa had emergency surgery to correct the heart defect and began life with her grandparents Rosemary and Joseph. Downstairs the children had grown considerably and the cellar was becoming cramped. Fritzl started converting more space for Elizabeth, Kirsten and Stefan. Fritzl is beginning to try to normalize this downstairs life. So he's moving in refrigerators, he's moving in things that uh, the, the, the children downstairs might want to play with. There's a television there, so they're aware of what the outside world is like. They have pets, there's a goldfish, there's a canary. But Fritzl is responsible for everything that goes into that space. On the 16th of December, 1994, a second child arrived on the doorstep. Another note was found from Elizabeth saying the baby was called Monica. Lisa and Monica were adopted by their grandparents. British-born reporter Mark Perry ran the story of the second baby in the newspaper, Cronen Zeitung. When the babies were dropped on the doorstep, two of them, 
the police constable phoned me again because I have good contact with them and he said yeah we have this funny case and, and the baby lying in front of the door and we have no suspicions but where's the mother we've got to find the mother because they the children they want to grow up with a mum with a real mum and granddad is looking for her and he was all the desperate father what the hell where is she I hope she's not been murdered or anything like that no crime committed Elizabeth please 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 phone us as every parents who have a, uh, a child going missing because you never know what happens murder case kidnapping and he put forward the story later oh she's in a cult somewhere satanistic cult all with devils and what's her name and, and all in his sick mind and you weren't suspicious I weren't sub so suspicious and I thought what a, what a terrible mother and, and I, I feel sorry for that now because calling Elizabeth a terrible mother but in a way I'm not to blame because everybody believed it on the 28th of April 1996 Elizabeth Fritzel gave birth to twins Michael and Alexander Josef Fritzel had now fathered six children with his own daughter. Michael is very sick, has breathing difficulties, and Fritzel, in effect, allows the little boy to die. What Fritzel does with Michael is burn him in the furnace of the house. So he destroys the body. That leaves the second little boy, Alexander. And again, I think simply pragmatically, Fritzel can't take the risk of Alexander dying. So here's a third foundling that's left on the doorstep of 40 Ebstrasse. This is the main street in Amstetten, a small town in Lower Austria. And this is the house where the Fritzel family lived, 40 Ebstrasse. Professor David Wilson, it is so ordinary, it's just a typical everyday Austrian scene. You cannot believe it. Can yes, you? the banality of evil is a phrase that comes to mind. Amstetten, a very quiet town, but look, this is a very busy street. And yet Fritzl would have us believe, would have the Amstetten authorities believe that three babies could be left on a doorstep with nobody noticing. And Elizabeth Fritzl spent all those years in a cellar at the back of this property. How did she survive? Well, I think the only way we can explain that survival is her own personal resilience and then the psychological concept of the Stockholm Syndrome, whereby the person who's been taken hostage learns to accommodate the hostage taker. In other words, if the hostage wants to survive that experience, they have to do basically what the hostage taker wants them to do. And Fritzl made her frightened to try and escape. Absolutely. Part of the Stockholm Syndrome is making the hostage feel as if there is literally no escape. He convinces Elizabeth that there's gas traps, that there's uh, electronic doors, that there's no way anybody can hear her cry. It's part of the process of controlling her in that space. Josef Fritzl had control over two families, his upstairs life and his downstairs secret. But this still wasn't enough. Work trips provided him with more opportunities and left Elizabeth completely alone in the cellar with her two children. He would often be gone for a few weeks at a time and, and during that time the family would be left to their own devices. Uh, I mean, there would be enough food and water for them to survive. But of course, anything could have happened. There could have been a fire, there could have been you know, a case of illness, you know, they, would have, they could have been an emergency. He didn't seem to much care about that. He would just leave them without any contact to the outside world and then just come back three weeks later after a, a nice little holiday in the sun. By December 2002, Elizabeth Fritzel had been incarcerated for 18 years in the cellar beneath the house. 14-year-old Kirsten and 12-year-old Stefan had never been outside the cellar. They'd never seen the sun. Elizabeth gave birth to a final child, a boy called Felix. Interestingly, there's a kind of mirroring going on here. Fritzl has seven legitimate children, and Fritzl, with the birth of Felix, has seven children through his incestuous relationship. So there's a sense of mirroring. And, I, and because he's so fond of Felix, and wants Felix to inherit, his, his world, you begin to see Fritzl trying to manage that process. How do I get this downstairs family 
integrated with the upstairs family. And part of that's pragmatic. He wants Felix to go to school. He realizes he can't send uh, Felix to school. And perhaps even by this stage, Fritzl had realized there can't be a fourth foundling found on the doorstep. Fritzl started to make plans to free Elizabeth at the end of 2008. But in the middle of March that year, 19-year-old Kirsten became seriously ill. The only medication at their disposal was aspirin. So she had been given aspirin for weeks, but obviously didn't help. And um, Elizabeth managed to convince Fritzl to take Kirsten to the hospital. And this was probably the first time in those 24 years where she really put her foot down. She was adamant that she would just not go on if he would, were to allow Kirsten to die, which, which was probably what would have happened. On the 19th of April 2008, Elizabeth helped her father carry Kirsten upstairs before returning to join Stefan and Felix. The doctor at the hospital, Dr. Reiter, needed more medical information, but without the mother, no one could answer his questions. So a television appeal went out looking for Elizabeth, which Elizabeth saw on her television in the cellar. Elizabeth's world changed forever on Saturday the 26th of April. Elizabeth persuades Joseph that she has to go to the hospital to explain what's been happening to Kirsten. And therefore, uh, Joseph takes Elizabeth to the hospital. Dr. Reiter interviews Elizabeth, tries to get as much information as possible. And once that interview is finished, the police arrest Elizabeth, take her into a room and begin to interrogate her. And it's only when they threaten to take away her children that Elizabeth reveals for the first time what Josef Fritzl has been doing to her, and the police arrest Josef Fritzl, and the game is in effect up. Fritzl freed his other two children, Stefan and Felix, at the same time as releasing Elizabeth. What condition were they in, as far as you know, when they were released? Well, they were in a very bad condition at the time of their release. Um, I mean, you have to know that Fritzl kind of did try to provide as much care as possible for them. He, he, he brought them vitamin supplements, he, he, he brought them lamps uh, uh, because of the vitamin D deficiency, you know, they were never exposed to the sun and so on, but they were in, a, in a, an extremely bad condition, obviously. They, they, um, their, their skins were all pale. They had all sorts of infections because of the filth, uh, of, of, of the humidity of the place where they lived. It was, it was infested with bacteria, with insects, and so on. By Sunday, the 27th of April, news of Elizabeth's 24 years of enslavement had spread. The press began to arrive, and the forensic experts entered the cellar of 40 Ebstrasse in Amstetten. The years of abuse and rape had ended, and now the family had to adapt to a strange new world outside. I'm reinvestigating the horrifying incarceration of Elizabeth Fritzl by her father Josef, and Austria's reaction to his brutal actions. It was at the end of April 2008 when the world realized the horror that was unfolding in the small town of Amstetten. Elizabeth Fritzl had revealed the unimaginable crimes of her father. But the immediate focus, though, was on her first child, 19-year-old Kirsten, who was seriously ill in hospital. Tell me a little about the reaction of, first of all, Kirsten when, when she woke up in hospital? It had been actually very moving. I talked to the doctors. She just, like in a film, just slowly opened the eyes, looked around, and the first thing she said, I want to watch a Robbie Williams concert. The second thing, ah, a new life is starting for all of us. Let us be happy. Little Felix pressing his nose to the window, going in this car for the first time in his little life, watching all the lights, seeing the moonlight for the first time and gluing his little nose till it's white to the window shield of the, of the car, just looking, staring, wide eyes, saying nothing. That was his first look at the normal life. 
Colonel Frank Polzer, the head of Lower Austria's criminal police, held an impromptu press conference on the 27th of April. He told the world that Josef Fritzl had kept his daughter in his cellar for 24 years and that she'd borne him several children. The press went wild. Boyan, tell me what the reaction was like in Austria when, when news of the whole Fritzl affair became public. And I think the newsreaders were themselves in disbelief about what they were actually reading from, from the local wire, uh, which was based on a, on a, on a press release from, from uh, Amstetten's police. Within two days, they had about 800 camera teams and journalists and, you know, interpreters, fixers, um, TV vans, satellite dishes. It is our duty to investigate the concurrent circumstances which made it possible that such crime which shocked all of us deeply could happen. In Austria, there was a, there was a huge backlash against uh, the international coverage, and part of it was justified because, you know, um, especially tabloids from the English-speaking world were very intrusive because they were hungry, they were demanding images from the family, you know, they were demanding details of the ordeal, and, um, and the family refused, Elizabeth refused, and she refuses to, this very day to be photographed to speak to anyone, you know, she doesn't want her story told by herself or the family, she doesn't want them to be in the spotlight. Following his arrest, the authorities ordered a psychiatric evaluation of the 73-year-old Josef Fritzl. Was he insane or was he suffering from a deep-rooted, profound personality disorder? Dr. Adelheid Kastner was asked by the courts to assess Fritzl's reasons behind his actions. Was this the most awful case you have been involved with yourself? You can't really imagine what 24 years mean. You can't. I remember I was standing down there in the cellar and thought, well, they were down there for 24 years. So now I try to imagine what that means. And I thought, well, where, where have I been 24 years ago and what happened in this time? Mm. And it feels like forever. It feels like endless. Is it possible for you to paint a picture for me of, of what the cellar was like. It was quite a mess, with all kinds of machine parts lying around, and, and the writing desk, and, and it was a, a rabbit warren of rooms, of cellar rooms. Yeah? And in the far corner was a, a cupboard, and behind that cupboard was a, a door that was one meter per one meter and it was a metal frame filled with concrete like that and you had to creep through it because it was only one meter high to go on your knees and then you could behind the door you could stand up again and it was a, a corridor it was leading to another door like that you had to go down on your knees again, and then you came to a kind of provisions room, you know, where you had shelves and the fridge. And then you came to the living quarters. You know. From there on, the, the doors were relatively normal. And the rooms were so that I could stand there, could easily stand there. And it was humid. It smelled rotten. It was not a nice place to live in. On the 16th of March 2009, Josef Fritzl was brought to trial here at St. Polten, the capital of Lower Austria. He was charged with rape, enslavement, incest, and the murder of one of the children he'd conceived with his daughter, Elizabeth. At first, Josef Fritzl entered a plea of not guilty. What was his demeanour at the trial? He was polite. He answered the questions. He was sitting there like a stone. Hmm? But he changed his plea when he saw Elizabeth. And he had to listen to her. 
He couldn't close his ears. Yeah? He had to listen to what she was saying. And what she was saying was quite another story than he was telling. Yeah? And she was telling about how horrible the time was and it had been and how, how brutal it had been and how, how horrible the time was. Yeah? And that she did not at all feel like uh, a partner, or that she didn't see that as a partnership, you know, that she saw it as you know, a crime. And I think somehow this got to him. Her testimony was recorded, uh, was video recorded, and this was used as evidence throughout the trial, as, as were the testimonies of some of the children. But um, she decided to, to show up as a final act of defiance, you know, she just wanted to see him there. Uh, in the dock, you know, being put on trial, shamed, you know, his crimes exposed for everyone to see. For the first time in, in her life, she was over 40 years old at the time. She had been abused by him for the whole of her life, basically, ever since her early childhood. Her whole family had been abused by him. Um, he was a tyrant. He, he kind of ruled over her faith for, for the whole of her life. And this was the one final moment where she kind of appeared as a free, independent woman and, and he was on trial. So I think that appearance made an impact. He burst into tears, reportedly, and then, um, and then changed his plea to guilty. After a four-day trial, Josef Fritzl was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment for murder by neglect, 20 years for enslavement, 15 years for rape, 10 years for deprivation of liberty, five years for coercion, and one year for incest. Elizabeth and her children are now living a secluded life away from the media in an undisclosed location so the children can have normal lives. It's amazing, she didn't go mad, isn't it? I think she didn't go mad because she had the children. I think it would be it would have been almost impossible for her to survive alone on her own. But she had a reason to live. You know? She had the children. She taught the children. She tried to maintain an almost normal life. You know, she made the children get up at the, at the set time, and she she made breakfast for the family, and she had them go to school, so to speak. That is, she taught them. She tried to maintain a normal almost a seemingly normal life. And I think that is what saved her. Do you think, in his own strange, perverted way, he loved her? He can't love anybody. He definitely can't. Yeah? He's incapable of loving anybody. But he is convinced that he loved her. And he says, well, she was like a second wife to me. She was like my second marriage. What are your feelings now about Joseph Fritzl? You can't have feelings for such a person. I don't have feelings. Anyway, the sentence is, well, he's an old man. He won't get out of there. I didn't like him as a child. He was unlikable. And now, after the affair, I can't find words. It is, it's good that he's been put away and that you don't have to see him anymore. And as we stand in front of this grim, fortress-like building, your final thoughts on Josef Fritzl, the man? I think this is almost the best angle to view 40 Ibstrasse in Amsterdam because this building behind me reminds me of some of the prisons I've worked in. And, you know, my final thoughts would be these, Fred. This isn't New York, this isn't London, this isn't some kind of anonymous urban environment. It's sleepy Amstetten. And therefore, the thing to take away is sometimes the most dreadful of crimes can happen in the most ordinary of places. For me, the case of Josef Fritzl is one of the most shocking ever. The word cruelty doesn't begin to describe the torture handed out to Elizabeth and her young family by their father. How any father could commit such a crime is beyond me. Justice, of course, has been served. Josef Fritzl will die in prison. But for Elizabeth and her children, the scars will last a lifetime. 
was the murdered woman the victim of a dangerous obsession, a classic love triangle, or something altogether more sinister? Brand new, unusual suspect is next.